This is episode number 60, and we are up. The Our Town Podcast coming to you from Studio West in Limestone County in Madison City. It gets a little confusing at times on what county I'm in, what city I'm in. But uh, just a always a request if you have, if this is the first time you've checked out the podcast, thank you for coming. Welcome. Hit the, 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 you know, what do they say? Smash the, the like buttons and the notica- <laughs> notification bell, all that kind of stuff, right? So we're on YouTube and Spotify and Anchor and video format and everything else is audio. So it goes out to Google, Amazon. I, I can't even name them all. It just goes to all of that. Um, but please, I've been doing this a year now. This is episode 60. And in a minute here, I will introduce our guest. But uh, it's, a, it's a grind. It's it's a lot of hard work that I enjoy, but um, but in any case, it just the support comes through comments, it comes through feedback, it comes through subscribers, that kind of stuff. So please, I don't ask every episode. This is kind of a rare thing, but this is kind of a milestone episode. Please, uh, if you like the podcast, spread the word, tell your friends and family about it, and um, and subscribe. And with that, Lisa DeFalco is here. And you are, are going to ask yourselves, well, who is Lisa DeFalco? <laughs> and Lisa DeFalco would respond. Um, my name is Lisa DeFalco. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, the CEO of TPG. Uh, we are new to Huntsville. We just opened in Huntsville it's at a year, year and a half ago now. Okay. And uh, I, our business is, uh, people tend to know our business more than the tagline. They probably know our business more than they realize they know it. At the tagline we start in the market is that this call may be monitored for quality assurance yeah. now 26 years ago. So that's uh, professionally who Lisa DeFalco is. She started that. Well, let me let me read this paragraph. Okay. Um, oh, God. And this, uh, well, I was just asking myself, you, you just showed up yeah. and on your way up to the studio, I thought to myself, because it's been some time since I first met you. I don't meet with every guest. Um, I don't always have the opportunity, but if I have the opportunity, I like to meet with the guest so I can get it. They can get a feel for me. I can get a feel for you, that type of thing. And I actually could not remember. Well, how did I meet Lisa? Or who did somebody connect us? So I found it, uh-huh. and I want to read it. Okay. And I think it also helps uh, a little bit summarize, you know, who you are. Okay. And I'm going to put on my glasses. I'm a new glasses. <laughs> I'm a You're welcome wearer. to that. New to that. And if you can't see it, you can see it to your right. But yeah. I'll read it. Uh, this was just a, you just reached out to me yeah, on LinkedIn, which was great. I enjoy okay. your podcast as it celebrates the many reasons why I chose to make Huntsville home for my company, TPG in 2021, bringing more than 100 jobs to downtown with another 100 on the way. Yes. And you're in West side square. Yes. Right. That's right. I'm not sure you know our story. I did not know, <laughs> but you know of our company. If you have ever called your bank or reservation center and heard the saying, this call may be monitored for quality assurance. I founded that saying and created an industry to serve it. We are now inventing the world's first AI assessment analyst. Her name is Anna, and I would love to tell you our story. So as I've mentioned before, it's always a thrill when people reach out to me. And I think I've had that good fortune probably the last several dozen episodes where people are reaching out or Mm, I'm being referred by past guests, you know, that and that's awesome. So there's there's that I wanted to share that. I definitely have heard the, uh, and I just called, I think uh, United Airlines might be one of your, yeah, one your of clients, clients yeah, right, in Toyota. Toyota. So I just called United last night. Okay. And sure enough, you know, because <laughs> I think sometimes the verbiage can, can um, it modifies modify yeah, somewhat. Yeah, over years, yeah. So this is amazing. I mean, not it's one thing, you are the first guest I've had where you're kind of doing the same, you, you're going on 24 years, right? 26. If not 26 years yeah. of TPG. You founded in 1996. Mm-hmm. It's kind of all you've done, which mm-hmm. is rare. <laughs> Some people have worked for a company a long time. They might retire, but it's one thing to own. I haven't had yet a company owner with that kind of uh, longevity. So it's exciting Thank because you. it really is constitutes all of mostly all of your working adult life. Yeah, or and maybe it says that I don't have any other skill. <laughs> I'm not really sure. That, <laughs> but that. it's not like you just founded a company within an existing industry. This, as you said, you created a new industry. Yes. So I, I think we just need to start there. Yeah. And and if if you could, we'll get back to being from Newark and Jersey as a Jersey girl <laughs> um, uh, later. 
But uh, I think we need to start with what's going on in your life in 1996. I, you weren't looking to start a company. You fall into this, yeah. essentially, where there was a, a potential customer that mentioned something about how they like to listen to their, the calls that come in to their customers yeah. or, or to, their, to their call center, and that customer just liked to listen. Mm-hmm. And everyone probably thought that was a little odd. And then you turn around and say, hey, would you pay me for six months? And I would do it for you. Yeah, exactly. So, so talk me through. Go into yeah. a lot more depth than you normally would on kind of that journey and, and who that person was and the circumstance. Well, I think so. You know, it's funny you mentioned it because I think it fits the the LinkedIn message that you put up, which is clearly Lisa DeFalco is not shy. Right. right. So yeah, I'm going to like get to know you. I know. And so I'm going to chat you up, as I always say. So I was, um, I just graduated college with no, um, no purpose in life and not, no direction. I didn't know what I was doing or where I was going. Push, just real quick, just push the mic in towards you. Yeah. Towards me. There we go. Oh, Look, you can push it from the right side. There, there we go. Perfect. There we go. There you go. Clearly my first podcast. So I didn't know. I want, learning. I really want the bass to come out in your the voice. The bass. Uh, yeah. you, you want my voice to sound darker and deeper? Cause I, I am so, cause so it's, you know. I, the funny thing is when people first meet me, <laughs> my voice is so deep that they expect me to be like six foot two. Right. And then I'm four ten. Right. right. And so every reaction for 26 years now, people like look up and look right down like, oh, my God, you're, you're Lisa. Her. Yeah, you're yeah. her. Your voice is so deep. I'm like, I know. I know. My voice is so deep and I'm yet I'm tiny. So you're that grizzled 26 year veteran. <laughs> That's CEO. it. That's it. Right. But even then, even when I was less grizzled and uh and uh, you know, just a punk trying to graduate college and figure out what I was doing, I uh, I still had this deep voice and uh, and this obnoxious laugh, and I uh, I was working in a call center, and a girlfriend of mine gave me this job. I had not I chose it because I didn't want to have to do a resume, like that was the thing you're supposed to do when mm-hmm. you're graduating college, and I was right. like, yeah, I don't want to do that. Right. And so um, so really like on the path of success, really <laughs> not. And so I go to work for this call center and... Uh, this was right after college? Right after college, yeah. I started, I got, did it during the summer before college ended and then right after college I was full time. And so I was there and I was willing, my, my, my uh, we all have secret, you know, superpowers and mine is I'm just a workhorse. I, I just don't ever get outworked and I never have. And mm-hmm. so uh, I would be willing to do any job and work all the time. And so one of the jobs was to sit when clients came into this call center. So all of it, we had a bunch of clients, a bunch of banks that were clients. And so instead of them opening up their own call centers inside their company, they would hire yeah. this company. So they would come in and want to like, you know, audit. They want to listen to these calls and no one wanted to do that. And so, um, you know, I, I was the kid. So I was, they were like, you go do it. So I would have to sit with clients And like plug into phone lines and listen to the calls and kind of chaperone them through these calls. Mm -hmm. And so I would do this and I had this one client that loved to come in every month. So at the beginning, I was like, why does he want to come here every single month to listen to these calls? Because this is the worst. This is the worst job in the call center is to sit here (laughs) listening to these calls and I have to do it. So um, but he went he would take these big yellow pad of paper and he would like take like so serious, take tons of notes. And I'm sitting here wondering like when he's leaving, when is he leaving? And uh, so we can go back to doing anything but this. So one day though, in all these notes, pages and pages, he just says to me how much he loves doing this. Mm -hmm. And like, he's a senior vice president in a really fancy suit. And I'm a scrub, you know, I'm just like this back office scrub in this call (laughs) center. Right. And I'm like, why is this fancy guy who clearly is smart, went to a, a really known college and all that. And why would he want to do this job? And he says to me, well, because I get to listen and hear what my customers are saying about my products and my company. And that's when he, you mentioned, he flippantly says, I'd pay somebody to do this. Hmm. And, uh, and I'm sitting there looking at him and I, uh, I always joke that I probably realized I didn't think I could hold a job for more than a year. Cause I say to him, would you pay somebody for six months? Right? And he's like looking at me like, so you are the loser. You look like you are. Okay. <laughs> you know? So wait, you're going to be out of work in six months. Okay. And I was like, I would do that. I'll do it for you. And like, just kind of overnight like that. So he was like, well, I'm not kidding. I mean, if you'll do this, I'll pay you. And so I was like, okay. 
Sure. Why so, not? So was he looking for, help me understand, was there a gap in what you all were doing from a call center? So I'm assuming you're, you're outsourcing. There's lots of different customers there, yeah. right? It's a, it's a call center for many, many companies. One yes. of them happens to be this client. He comes in, yet he wasn't, either you all weren't providing the full service he was looking for or he was looking for it to be done cheaper? No, he. there was no service at the time. It was not. So he, you would call, if you hired a call center, you would call as the senior vice president of marketing and say, so how the, how's it going? And your call center you know, account manager would say, it's going great. And they'd be like, any good feedback from clients? And they'd be like, yes, none, some. Gotcha. And so he would then want to get really deep on what are people saying. Okay. And so that wasn't, that wasn't part of the service. It was, we'll make the calls, we'll take the calls, mm -hmm. but we're not going to analyze this. We're not going to tell you. They were more interested in volume. Yes. And what that's as an indicator to, you've got a problem because all these calls are coming in or there's not a lot of volume and that's good. Exactly. Okay. That's exactly right. All and right. so then he would have to do it himself. All bankers would have to do that themselves. They'd have to go listen and li learn from them themselves. Why are people calling me? Why are they not calling me? Mm -hmm. if, it's a, if it's a sales program and if he was in charge of marketing, why aren't people calling me to a call and apply for my credit card? Gotcha. Why aren't they doing that? And so we would be like, oh, I don't know. The calls, the phones aren't ringing, right? And if they, the phones did ring and people still didn't sign up for the credit card, he'd say, how come? They weren't signing. We'd be like, oh, they said no. Got it. He's like, but why? So that's why he would come in and he would take all these gr crazy notes. And sometimes he would find out what was happening about his product that people would say, oh, that fee's too high or whatever the issue mm -hmm. was, which as a call center, we weren't really struck. We weren't really structured to, to give him that type of information. And this was your first ever call center type job. Yes. You've never done telemarketing or No, it was my first entrance into telemarketing. Okay. Yeah. And for what it's worth, you went to Lycoming? is it Lycoming? Lycoming College. Lycoming College. Yeah. Which is just on the banks of the Susquehanna yeah. and Williamsport. It and is. just across the river is most people are gonna know the Little League World Series compound. Exactly. Did you ever go into any of those games? Oh yeah, absolutely. That was the thing. That was what you did in Williamsport before yeah. this the semester started. That's a that's definitely on like my bucket list. I don't actively pursue it, but I'm like, yeah. you know, one of these years I need to go. Yeah. I really need to go. You know, the first time I was there, so I, I go there because it's um I mean I'm glad I went, but I it was two hours away from my um two and a half hours away from where I grew up in New Jersey, right? Yeah. And uh my parents were like, You have to go driving distance. So um that's how I chose that. And so I get there, and I've, I've never been outside of Jersey at the time, mm -hmm. New York or Massachusetts. My, my mother's family is from Boston. Okay. So I don't realize that I have this horrendous Jersey accent. <laughs> like, I call, and people are mocking me the first couple of weeks I'm there. And I call home. I'm like, Ma, I don't understand. Nobody understands what I'm saying, you know? <laughs> and then she's they're just like... She's like, I don't understand. You sound good to me. You sound good. Yeah, right? And I'm like, well, I don't think we speak English. And, and what's funny is so over the years, I don't speak English. I speak this Jersey thing. And I wind up, you know, evaluating calls for proper English yeah. in the world. So I was yeah. just, I want, we'll come back to it. I just wanted to pull on that thread of what your workhorse, your, yeah. you have a tremendous work ethic. Now, that was your first foray into call centers. Yeah. And it sets up your, your career. But what other types of jobs did you have, whether you started in Jersey doing something? Walk me through just a little bit of, of what was expected of you working and, you know, what kind of jobs you had. Yeah. So even in, so in high school, I took, um, I took a couple of jobs at a time. So, you know, my, you know, I was never always good at them. So I would, was like... I worked at a pizzeria, and at the same time, I was a hostess at a, a local steak restaurant, mm -hmm. and um, and I worked at an office. So my my mom was um, she did medical uh, typing, so and court typing, court like a stenographer yeah. typing, and so I was nine or ten, and um, I would I helped her. I started learning typing, about nine or ten years old, uh, so that because she, she was making ten cents a pay, a page wow. that she could generate. And so I would type to help get more of those pages, well, yeah. right? 
So that started, I guess that started the work ethic, right? When I was like nine or 10 years old. And, um, and then I took, did that job in addition to the local pizzeria and the, you know, and the working in the hostess. And, but my typing skills got me a job in an office as a admin. Really? Yeah. And all in high school. So I was doing all of that in, in high school along the way. So, um, and then in college, I wound up taking a job as a waitress and um, down at the Jersey Shore. So, so, oh, really? so cliche. And, uh, <laughs> but what I loved about it was that I, you could work every day, seven days, both shifts. So a lunch and a dinner. And if you didn't take off, I'd make like seven grand in a summer back then. I was like, wow. I felt like a rich person. I wasn't, but you know, yeah. but it just, the secret was you don't take off. You work, you know, you work every single day of the summer and you work double shifts. And so you're if covering it, for other people all, all the time. Yeah. And I was the one who would work on the Saturday, Saturday night, work to the, you know, the late night shift. And I didn't really think twice about it, but my family has, you know, we the, like many, we just have had nothing growing up. Yeah. So being able to put any food on the table was always a positive thing. And uh, my my grandmother who raised me, she she worked constant, mm -hmm. constant. And so when you're around it, you're just kind of you don't know better. Right. It's just like, oh, that's what we do. We work a lot. <laughs> do you mind? Well, let me ask you, I'm going to go to a question, but you made me think of something. My first job, I was a busboy. Actually, I think I talked about this episode or two ago at a seafood restaurant. Uh -huh. And I had worked there like the first weekend, I don't know, like a Friday night shift and a Saturday night shift. Well, the next, then the, the schedule comes out and I'm looking at it and I'm like confused because I'm working. Okay. So Friday night, which was basically 5 PM to midnight. Yeah. By the time, you know, you clean the kitchen and get out of there. And then it's like, there's like this time of 7 AM slash four for Saturday. And then also Sunday. Like the Sunday day shift, like mm -hmm. eight to four. I'm like, what's up with the slash? Like, oh, you're working double shift. It's like, what? So I'm in high school, right? I'm like a sophomore in high school, and I'm looking at this like, okay, so I have to come Friday night from 5 p.m. to midnight, come back at 7 a.m. on Saturday, work till four, one hour off, and then work five to midnight, and then come back Sunday, eight to four. All right. I mean, like, yeah. I didn't really complain because it was money. Yeah. But I remember coming to school like on Monday, like, what'd you do this weekend? Nothing. <laughs> like I literally left I, school, whatever, on Friday, and I'm and I I've been in the in the seafood restaurant the whole time. Yeah, I did. I did literally nothing this weekend. Uh, I lived it. <laughs> yeah, I lived it, and I didn't. We didn't know better, right? We're like, yeah. well, that's I was that's sixteen good. years old. Like whatever. Yeah. Like I gotta do that. That's yeah. right. Well, even in college, but so we went back to school at the end of August. But a big money weekend, Jersey Shore, is Labor Day weekend. Okay. So I would cut, I would talk to the school and say, I'm coming back the Tuesday after Labor Day. So I'd miss like a week and a half, two weeks of school. Mm. And, but I made money. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, and I never even thought twice about it. I was like, well, that's. Because you want to take I'm, advantage of it. I'm going to take advantage of it. And everybody else was like, no way am I going to work that much or I want to be at the beach or I'm going back to school and I want to go have fun there. And I was like, well, I'll get there in September, but I'm going to go work. Yeah. Yeah. I want to come back later to, to your grandmother, but let's continue back on. So this customer co client says, okay, I'm going to hire you. Yeah. I'm going to pay you. And what's the, the use case is just for him to get more fidelity into the call, more That's information. Right. Um, so talk about that. How does that, so TPG starts like right there. Do you go home and, and figure out, okay, I need to incorporate. I got to get insurance. I'm, I'm going to be a business working for this, this, this uh, customer. Yeah. I, well, TBG starts, but I'm kind of the unlikely CEO. Right. So, and I'm, you know, in my twenties at the time and I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing in life. And, uh, so I start, but I don't incorporate. I don't think of, I just, I just go to work. <laughs> this okay. is what I do. I work. Right. right? And so, I just start evaluating calls and get paid as a you know contractor really. Right. Um, and what he was looking to do was to get more of those calls evaluated, and of course delegate it right because it was something he enjoyed doing for value. But if he can do it, if he could have it done on his behalf inexpensively, mm -hmm. 
And now he can just get a little write up that tells him here's everything he would have spent hours trying to you know learn about then even better. Right. So I did. I really didn't think much about it. I just started to do that work. And it wasn't it wasn't for a couple of years okay. that I actually started to realize we had a I had a business here and opened up TPG. So I probably was that's between like ninety four and ninety six mm-hmm. when I really get myself organized and realize, oh, I should open a business and I should hire people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that just comes because I was evaluating, listening to these calls, literally 15 hours a day. Because um, this is before anything could be recorded. Sure. So if you wanted to listen to a phone call, it had to be when it was occurring. So calls occur between 9 a.m. and midnight across the country, West, You know, t- thinking about all the time zones. So I would listen from 9 a.m. to midnight and uh, and then write up summaries. and. Uh, so on the recording side, you're saying the FTC or the FCC hadn't really caught up yet or there wasn't regulation in place um, providing the, the boundaries, if you will, and, and people's rights and what a company has the right to do and right to record. Yeah, there weren't, there weren't boundaries. There wasn't also the technology. Right. So, you know, right now you, we can record anything i mean we're recording this right now and mm-hmm. uh that that didn't exist this is not you know that didn't exist so your ability in the commercial market now you know there's lots of news that says the government has been recording conversations for you know decades sure. and decades but i'm talking the commercial market wasn't right. recording conversations and then when they started to record them we were doing it on cassette tapes those little tiny ones right <laughs> yeah those little those little tapes yeah. that was what we were recording uh, and so those were hard to, and if you recorded them, you were recording them and then had to ship them to somebody to listen. So that's cost prohibitive. Yeah. And so it all was live. Right. Everything had to be live. So yeah. do you remember, so you're, you're off and running, there's a, there's, let's just say a 1099, right? You're yeah. a, kind of an independent contractor supporting this customer. Do you remember some of the first, like, big discoveries or um like aha moments in that you know like where you had a this new finding or a different way to look at the the data you know or to as you're listening to the call where you're now giving true value add yeah to this person do you have, do you remember some of those wait a minute type, yeah type value add moments i i do well so i would start to ask people beyond this one individual mm-hmm. Why would they listen to phone calls? Would they, because people would, but I should say this way, most people said, I would not. So he was kind of out on the edge, right? And, and, uh, but then, so I would say, well, if you were to listen to phone calls, why would you do it? And no matter who I asked in the, that I knew uh, in the business, the answer was the same. It was, help me improve the result of that phone call. And so that was my first discovery was whatever I'm listening for Mm -hmm. and to, it has to be, Hey, the, this call's purpose was X. So the call was to, to fix your customer service issue. Did we resolve it? Did I, did I improve that result of that call? Mm -hmm. And so I learned really early that that's what it all, that's what, that's what mattered was that if I can't define that I was improving the result of the call, then there was no purpose to listen to it. Gotcha. So that was the first. And then I had the really good fortune. So the banking industry is rather small. Mm -hmm. So they all know each other. Uh, And so, you know, he tells two friends who tell two friends type of thing. And before I know it, we're listening to a bunch of different brands that people recognize um, because they're all like, we know, I don't want to listen to these calls. Well, this, would this young person listen to calls for me? (laughs) I don't want to do it. So, uh, so now we have um, a group of customers who, are listening to calls. And one of them happens to be at the time what they call General Electric's Capital, GE Capital. G, yeah. That was, and they're still um, a client in their life form today, but that was just remarkable because they, you know, Jack Welch, mm-hmm. who is a renowned CEO, he has this whole method called Six Sigma that mm-hmm. he is passionate about and how to identify a defect in a process and sure. fix it which aligns to improving the results, right? 
So I become a student of that. And I learned that that has to, so now I have to have rigor. So it's about improving the result, but through the lens of a corporate rigor. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I learned from GE and I say, okay, I can, I understand that I'll create rigor around. So it's not just what do I feel like today? What am I listening for today? I have to create a kind of a standard of what to listen for. And then that's the final, like, aha, not final, but for the early days, the final aha was another client who said, I, when I said to them, what would you like me to listen for? And they turned to me and said, you tell me. Hmm. You're the one who's doing all this listening for all of us, all these banks. What should we be listening for? And so you just add those three things together, improve my results, have a rigor. You tell me, Lisa. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay. Now I have, now I have an idea for this business. If we can not just listen, but actually put together the the rigor, the method of how to define this great call through the lens of improving the result, people will buy it. How soon into, did you hire anybody before you were officially like TPG? Did you have some pe- helpers? Yeah, we had some helpers. Yeah, absolutely. Like, ha- like give me an idea of like, what, what was the bandwidth? Like, what could you all handle in, in a typical, for a customer... If a thousand calls come in, like what could you really handle in a given day, like percentage wise on? Oh, a fraction, a right. fraction. Yeah. Back in those days, it really wasn't even about how many calls we can listen to. I mean, that was the desire, but it was about how many hours can we stay awake to <laughs> listen? <laughs> right. You know, because it was all live. I mean, we might be listening um, and there's no calls coming into that call center for the hour. And you're Mm -hmm. just sitting there on dead air, just waiting for somebody to call. And then there was another time that you're listening and you can't keep up, right? You can only listen to one phone call at a time. And there's 400 people that just called at the same time. Yeah. So it was really about how many hours. And um, as you would expect, nobody wanted to listen 15 hours. You know, all my helpers. Nobody was going to do that. (laughs) Nobody was insane like I was. And uh, (laughs) so at most they would listen to six hours a day and then want to shoot themselves, right? That's a lot of listening to do. So I would sell it as blocks of time. Okay. We'll listen to blocks of time, whether you get a call or not back, back in those days. And you're handling all time zones? All time zones. And you were in, where were you in Jersey? East Coast. I was in, I was, yeah, yeah. Okay. East Coast. Got it. Yeah. So then now let's just kind of talk about the formation of TPG. Yeah. And um, how many people you know how many employees or you know managers you know were with you in, in starting that process yeah and you know talk just talk me through that so when we opened the doors so by then we had three ongoing clients that that we were serving and um and that was pretty exciting um i mean we had projects but here and there but like just every day where people they were doing enough calls uh, in their call centers, they were like day, night, every day, just listen to calls. And uh, so I had seven people that I recruited to start those. Well, including my three-year-old son, perhaps he'll tell you. So maybe that's <laughs> eight. But um, yeah, seven people that that got started, including myself. So six other people. That's nice. Yeah. It was really exciting. You know, that first year was uh, just remembering that it could be a business. Uh, and we would listen to phone calls. Now, by then... The calls were being recorded. Right. And that's, you know, right before I opened the formal doors. Um, oh, right around the same time I opened the formal doors. They, uh, I'm in call centers and for this bank. Uh, and they had me fly to the actual call center because, you know, the people were not thrilled that I was listening so many hours a day. And uh, so I was there to make nice mm-hmm. and tell people that, we should, you should want to listen to phone calls. Sure. And that's when we started to get the bubbling about the regulations of what do you mean you're tapping into calls? What do you mean you're going to start recording calls, even if it's cassette tapes? What are you talking about? So you have to notify people. And that's when I came up with that tagline and said, well, what if we just said this call may be monitored for quality assurance? I think people will be okay with that. So you said that on a, you were sent somewhere, you're kind of meeting these people. They're questioning you. 
whatever you're having yeah. a discussion yeah. and you and you come up with this yeah the tagline this idea yeah and they uh were like well we'll we'll try it and um first everyone thought you know oh my god everybody's gonna hang up nobody's gonna accept that no consumer is gonna accept that but they didn't nobody hung up and uh and before we knew it that that is what really mm-hmm. grew the business then on the on the legal side or the yeah. changing uh, policy the the banks really are, are using their lawyers and their attorneys to work with the government to to uh, allow calls to be recorded yeah is that correct you didn't have to do any roll your you, you didn't have to do that they were doing that on your behalf they were doing that yeah, yeah yeah and they just needed to know that there was something compliant okay that what we were doing in those calls whether it be I was there or, or in their own call centers that it was compliant and so that tagline um, I mean, obvious statement. It just took a, it just took a life of its own. So it went from being, oh, you know, this one bank doing it to be quote in compliance to others saying, how should we do it? How should we do it? And all mm-hmm. of a sudden, before we know it, you just it's just everywhere. Like everybody's using it. So is that is that a trademark? Ah, oh, gosh. Do you mind me bringing that up? No, I don't mind you bringing that up. I'm just wondering. Yeah, no, it wasn't. I didn't trademark it. Okay. I didn't trade market. So nobody I was in owns my 20s. it. Nobody owns it. Yeah. Nobody well, owns it. So mid twenties is important, and you just mentioned your son. And I think it's it bears when you have him about the time you started it before TPG, yeah. right? Before yeah. you were in the call center. Yeah. So before you really even got going, which is I think it very important to the story of a young mother, a newborn. Yeah. And now it's like you discover this career path and you're not going to look back on that nor, you know, you're not going to, you're going to do both. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Did that, um, how tough was that? Oh, um, extremely. I always joke with my children that if you want to know what it's like to walk a half a step away from the impossible, (laughs) walk my shoes. (laughs) So don't, don't critique me on it. Right. You know, um, it was really hard. I mean, we, I was, yeah, a, a mom, I was, uh, single, and, uh, and I, I don't know that I was focused on my career. Mm-hmm. You know, I was, I was focused on making a living. And I think those are very, very different. Sure. Right. And so I found this path to make a living and, uh, and I just chased it. And I, I don't, I would love to say it was like, that's why I say it's an, I was an unexpected CEO because it's not like I had this business plan or this strategy. Yeah. I was single mom making a living. I had an idea that was pretty much gave, given to me, if you think about it, from that banker, really, mm-hmm. right? And I just ran with it, willing to work, yeah, and um, and balancing, and you know, I mean, I work. I, I don't know. Sometimes I look back and how did I work fifteen hours a day, which isn't an exaggeration, unfortunately, and raise my son. It, it's a great. Yeah, you know, he says he was raised by wolves, right? And I, <laughs> and probably there's some truth to that. It's, did you have family watching him? No. Just babysitters? I had a babysitter. Daycare? Yeah. I had a babysitter, and then when he was older, daycare that did it. And what we would do, when I opened up TPG, by then he was three, so he was in a a daycare, you know, a preschool. Um, Preschool would close at 5.30, so I had to get there. Yeah. I was that mom who showed up at 5.40 that they would be yelling at, right? Um, And then I would pick him up. And uh, drive him back to the office. And along the way, there was this pizzeria that um, I we would pick up something different every night, like a pizza or a pasta, something in that you know that they would serve every night. Mm. And then I would we would go back to the office, and he had a little like you know couch chair there, and uh, I would work. He would hang out. We'd eat dinner at the office, and he'd fall asleep, and then we would go home when I was done. Wow. Yeah, that was our schedule for years. That was our schedule. Really? Mm. So you guys undoubtedly are very close. Uh, I like to think so. <laughs> uh, yeah, Ryan is, uh, yeah, I would like to, I, you know, oh, there were years where, he, rightly so, he was like, I got to go get some normalcy in my life here, right? Um, yeah. And he wound up in uh, going to Tulane and having a great career um, on his own. So, but yeah, we're really close. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. 
you know, I asked Carolyn Kimbrough this question. She owns Peachtree Interior Design at Stove House. And I asked her this question, and I'm gonna, I would ask you the same question. Was there anybody that was trying to talk you out of TPG or, or the career mm. versus take, making sure you take care of your son and do something that doesn't monopolize all your time? Did you have any kind of those naysayers in your life? Or kind of somebody that said to Carolyn, they knew you well enough that bowl in a china shop, ah, she's going to do it anyway. There's no, no reason to try to talk her out of it. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I know I was talk, try to talk to out of for a really? long time. Well, you know, and I, I give a lot of grace to um, the family members in particular that try to talk me out of it because not only was I speaking career, even though I wasn't using the language of career, right? I was talking about doing something that was unheard of. Yeah. Right. And so they were like, so wait a minute, you're going to listen to calls. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. What calls? Call center calls for banks. You're going to do that. Like, who does that? And so it was, you know, I had. um, You had to trust yourself. I had to trust myself on it. Yeah. 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 I remember my um, my stepfather was like so sassy about it one night. And he was like, so what do you think? What do you think? You're going to be successful? Like that's not even a real business, you know that, right? Like there's, he was an electrician. He's like, go find a trade. Like this isn't a job. You don't. There's no. Yeah. Maybe Google this. There's not. I didn't say Google because that's not the language then. But you know, did you research this? Have you ever heard of this type of job? And I was like, no, but I think it, I think it could be something. So um, yeah, I didn't have. To, I just made sure I didn't listen to anybody around me. Now you had mentioned to someone else on different podcasts that you didn't really discover grace until your forties. Yes. So now, you know, it's, it's one thing we all look at life differently as we get older, yeah. at different stages. Did you hold grudges though? Or were, was there some anger in your twenties and thirties? And it wasn't until your forties that you kind of had, okay, let me look, let me have the benefit of hindsight here and, and apply some grace to those people yes. in my life. Yes. Was that a growing process for that you? That was definitely a growing process. So I, I, I was successful, whatever that language means, professionally, out of sheer spite mm-hmm. for twenty years, uh, or almost twenty years, really. I mean, I was just, I will prove you wrong. I, I'm going to succeed because the people around me said I won't. Right. So that fueled me for a long time. And then I meet a good friend of mine who um, teaches me grace without saying the word even. Um, He winds up uh, helping me find a way to be um, to become very recognized in our industry, serving uh, through through community service. Okay. And um, and along the way, I don't realize he's teaching me this, but he. At the end of his life, he passes when he's 53. Mm. Um, he turns to me and makes sure I realize that that which I have chosen, the path, is really through the lens of grace that allows me to be there, not through vinegar. It's not through spite. Yeah. And um, that sticks with me a lot. And one of the last things you know, he made me promise... Um, to live my life in a different way and required me to promise it. And, uh, and he said, I need you to promise me that you will leave nothing left unsaid and nothing left undone in your life and realize that you have been given the gift of grace Mm. to be here. And, um, I take that very, very seriously. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. You know, if, uh, let me just drop this in here. Um, you just made a comment and it made me think of power. You've talked to your kids about power versus like the thoroughbred. Yeah. It's one thing to recognize a thoroughbred after they've won. Yes. After the fact. Oh, what a wonderful, powerful horse. But it's another to recognize the power in in a thoroughbred before the race even starts. Amen. Right. Mm -hmm. And I just so happened, we just saw the movie air. Yeah. Which is about Michael Jordan. Yes. And Sonny Vaccaro and, David Falk and Phil Knight and all them. And, and I actually, I don't know how you follow. I've read some of like David Falk's books mm-hmm. um, and they're interesting or bi- biographies on Jordan, one of which was from David Falk. 
And I just get really interested in stories like that, especially like a Sonny Vaccaro. Oh, I didn't really know who this person was, and I'll just, I'll kind of like uh, hyper fixate on just doing some research and yeah. learning about the person because it's amazing to me that, as portrayed in the movie, which I think was pretty accurate because he was a consultant on it, um, his eye for talent. So let's he. Uh, I just heard him on Rich Eisen show, and yeah. he's talking about Kobe Bryant, mm. and he has a basketball camp. It's called ABCD Camp. Um, kind of one of those things. If you're, you know, star player, you're going to go to certain camps to get recognized and noticed, right, by mm-hmm. colleges and stuff. Mm-hmm. Now, Kobe, Kobe, of course, like LeBron, went right to the pros, no college. So you had to have seen him in high school or whatever. So anyway, he so he knew like Kobe's dad, Joe Jellybean Bryant, who played in the NBA and mm-hmm. stuff like in the early '70s. So he kind of like knew the family. Well, Kobe comes up to him. I think he was like a a sophomore or a junior in high school. And he comes up to Sonny because it's like his basketball camp. And he had played like in the underclassmen's game or or something like that. And um, But, you know, there's tons of talent there. And he just comes up and he says, hey, Mr. Vaccaro, you know, thank you for allowing me to be at your camp. And I want to apologize. He's like, apologize for what? He's like, well, I wasn't the best player in this camp. But next year, I promise you, I'm going to be the best player. And he had, Sonny had just started with Adidas at the time. I guess Nike fired him or, or something. And um, so the whole Jordan thing, we just had saw this movie. Now I'm seeing him being interviewed. And now it's like, oh, well, something happened at Nike. They let him go. Mm-hmm. Now he's at Adidas and they need a big splash. And he said, I never even saw him play in high school, but I knew just from the way he approached me and the confidence he had in himself. Kind of like that thoroughbred, yeah. right? The power yeah. that that's just pent up. That he's got, he has something to prove to everybody. Yep. And he and he was like, we went ahead and just like put things in motion. Like they kind of did it on like secretively. That that was their guy. Mm-hmm. He's like, I knew at that moment that that was my guy. And um and ultimately he was able to get him to to sign, and that led to like a bunch of other signings. And I really just was kind of thinking about like that's kind of what. Can you um, talk me through any those discussions you've had with your kids about that that concept of the recognizing the power and the thoroughbred? Yeah, I I love that. I I use that sighing all the time, as I was telling it, and uh, and I I think Kobe Bryant. I love the story. I think there's something so powerful when somebody is able to see that, mm-hmm. and I tell my kids it for two reasons. You know, one is when somebody doesn't see it, and uh, like like my upbringing, and you're constantly told you can't you can't you can't whatever then you you have to almost distance yourself from that Mm -hmm. because that's what i tell my kids from that angle i'm like listen you know if you it's really easy when people come around after you're successful and they say to you i always knew Mm. right it's so easy to say that you always you always knew are you sure you always knew because i know why you know now Mm-hmm. But along the way, and I tell my children that, and then I'm like, but you know, if you really want to change somebody's life, see it early, recognize the thoroughbred when they're just starting out. And I recognize it in all my three children. And I tell them that so that they have the freedom to do whatever they choose to do to be successful and peaceful with their lives. Mm-hmm. And my, my thir- the, you know, recognition of when I was, I recognized the thoroughbred was my friend. You know, I didn't realize it along the way, but he's empowered me so much because my dear friend, Tim Searcy, who I give credit to all the time, um, he recognized me as that thoroughbred long before anybody else did mm. and gave me the the support and just cheered me on when others wouldn't. Yeah. You know, and um, I think that's so powerful when, you know, you see that. And I, you know, that separates those that really believe in you versus those that are going to be with you because you're already celebrating. Yeah. <laughs> you know, those are the, they come along later and they're welcome to celebrate with you, but they're not the ones who really believe in you. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, what's amazing about your story too, is that we're talking mid nineties when, you know, desktop computers were kind of, they were very expensive. Yeah. Like computers were just coming into yeah. being a commodity, if you will, uh, infrastructure, that all that technology is going to change. It's going to change fast Mm -hmm. where you now you 24 years later, obviously there's been success, but there's probably been a tremendous amount of change and things that you didn't have necessarily have a background in, but you had to hire people 
that you that you trusted somewhat to to help you get there right mm-hmm. and just continue going forward as v- the more volume there is with stuff the more data there is well where are you going to store it right mm-hmm. how are you going to process it, that kind of stuff but we'll get there but um so now like as your so tpg starts you yeah. you're in jersey and at some point along the way not i guess it you end up in omaha yeah um but i love c- omaha do you yeah can you just talk about that gr- let's let's first talk about like the next set of like use cases so maybe if i'm on the right track here with something like technology related or just advancements and things um does the use case change and then the the need to hire more people because now you've you've broken it, a barrier yeah um can can you discuss that yeah so there are a couple of things happen so people it becomes part of our world so people it becomes familiar mm-hmm. so just by sheer um f- being familiar people there's more of it people are want to uh, invest in more and listening and so now other companies pop up doing that as well and what's fascinating to me about that is you know people say oh you know fight your competitor i loved competitors and the reason being is because when you f- i first opened the doors officially as cpg trying to find a bank that was going to opening a business account for a company. When you say, well, what do you do? And you're like, I listen to phone calls. <laughs> They're like, <laughs> what is that? Like, right. is that a real business? Is that money laundering? What are you really doing out there? You right, know? Right. And, uh, and so I welcomed all of these competitors that were starting to pop up at the same time. So that was changing. So now we had to have something differentiate it, you know, like mm-hmm. why, why us? Um, and that's when I wrote the method of defining a good call. Okay. So that separates TPG beyond just being the founders of the industry. But now if you want to know how to define a good call and you don't want to have to kind of whiteboard on your own, you would hire us to do that. So now I have to get involved in research. Now I have to study this, how to define a good call. Is it really meaningful? Mm -hmm. Can I really prove with science that the way we define this is going to drive those business outcomes. It's one thing to say it, another thing to live it. Mm -hmm. So that takes us down a path of behavioral research. I, the, I I never thought I would be in a behavioral research chair. And that's just not what, you know, this is Remember, I'm a single mom trying to make a living and Mm -hmm. now I'm in a, I'm a behavioral researcher and hiring people around me to, who are truly researchers and have degrees in such uh, disciplines to do it. So they create, with me, um, a data for- formula, and basically the method I write to define a good call gets proven. Hmm. And now we're in a new world because now we're at a method that the Fortune 500 wants to buy. They want to use it. So not just listening to call, but how we listen to the call mm-hmm. is how TPG then takes on to the next generation of business. And so that's that fuels the next generation of growth. Real quick, going back, even bef- so before that, you were talking about how the banker in that, in that community, they all know each other. Yeah. The word gets out. Was there also some a customer that was now attributing their successes to um, basically your services? Yeah. And making that known to other people. Yeah. And there's some sort of indicator, there's some metric. And what were those metrics? Well... First, it was the metric really just was somebody else will listen for you. Okay, right. right. And then when I wrote the method okay, and people started to be able to prove that their sales went up because they, because I listened, we listened to the phone call and told them the three things to change and now their sales are up or they're resolved more phone calls in customer service. So they started to tell the story about the improvement in their business from our, um, from our listening, okay. from our method. Okay. And our, the Fortune 500 community, I'll, I'll tell you, we've been blessed. We have a really cool following. Our clients are extremely um, committed to us. I'm very blessed with that. Along the way, they have been, um, they tell the story. They, they'll go out and they'll tell their network. They'll tell their, their colleague. They'll tell their, what you would call competitor, um, the people they know, because again, Fortune 500 is a pretty 
banking is a small industry, but every one of those sectors are rather small. They all, people mm-hmm. know each other inside those sectors. And so they would just, they'll tell each other because this is not competitive. It's really something that, you know, my business improved because of X, you should call Lisa too. And, uh, and we've been really blessed. So that's, that's how we got the next level of fuel for TPG. And then the next level after that, which really put us on the map was, um, my friend, Tim asked me to join a trade association to represent the contact centers around the globe, mostly in the United States though. And, um, they needed somebody who can be the voice of independence to s- explain what it means to be uh, have a good good call with your consumers, and to go to Washington, hmm. and go um, advocate for the use of teleservices, the telemarketing, teleservices, contact centers, and go to Washington regularly and meet with members of Congress as well as the FTC and all the alphabet soup of government, and explain what it means to deliver a great experience. So you've had to testify. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I've I've met. There was a time, there was a time years ago when I actually of four hundred and thirty five members of Congress. I knew four hundred and twenty. Really? Yeah, and uh, and I don't say that like, oh wow, look at me. I say it because it was a lot of work. We were up there all the time, advocating. And by the way, um, we weren't. They were all friends of ours. I mean, people know the legislation called the Do Not Call era. Yeah, Everybody sure. Everybody knows that. So I was at the forefront of that. Um, advocating for the contact center for the big business. Mm-hmm. Uh, and while I knew we weren't going to win that, I mean, when President Bush wants the do not call list to become legal, you're not going to change yeah. that. However, um, what we did was alter the legislation in favor of consumers to make sure that the businesses they were doing business with could convert, could contact them. Because at the time it wasn't, written that way yeah uh, so yeah so i've been really active in dc and understand all the regulatory compliance standards because i met with all the regulators how many do you have off the top of your head how many times you appeared before the senate or the house and testified um i don't even know really yeah most of it was in uh was you know non-public Okay. So I was the one who would go in when they wanted to really kind of hone in on that. I see. Um, but I, w- I was up there once a quarter, once a quarter, once every six weeks for about 14 years. Okay. So That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, it was really cool. It was really cool. It was extremely stressful. Um, it was during a time when, um, you know, the world was against contact centers. And uh, I was just trying to help us all through that to make sure that yeah. that would ali- you know, stay alive. and. One of my favorite stories is um, one of my favorite members actually is uh, was he's he's passed, but Elijah Cummings. I love oh, yeah. I love Elijah Cummings. Such a good man. Such such a good, passionate preacher. Mm-hmm. Um, didn't always agree with him. Yeah. Uh, but boy, I deeply really respected him, and uh, he represented one of the districts of Maryland, right? And he was very much against um, our industry for a moment. And then uh, I asked him to come do a tour to a bank, mm-hmm. contact center, in-house contact center in his district. And he did. He was kind enough to do that. Uh, and uh, at the time, he was the chairman of, uh, of the Congressional Black Caucus. Okay. And so he goes to the contact center. And <laughs> as he's walking through, he, people, he knows people. Right? And one of them was like, how's your mom? And he's oh, like, wow. oh, my God. It was one of his mom's friends who worked there, and he talked to all these kids that were getting their degrees at Howard University, his mm-hmm. alma mater, mm-hmm. um, getting working part time, right? And so it it made it real, like it, it was like this isn't just something, yeah. It's like real economic value to his constituents, and so then he had everybody. Then I then I was doing tours. <laughs> Uh, for members of Congress around the country. He did a 180. Yeah, uh, totally did a 180. Totally yeah. did a 180. And uh, great, great man. Great man. That's awesome. Yeah. I was going to ask you if you had any favorites or, or people who are really strong proponents. Yeah. But it sounds like Elijah was. Elijah was um, Representative Lee, Ta- uh, Lee Terry of, of Omaha. Okay. Got to appreciate that, man. Now he's on the Republican side. And uh, boy, did he take heat. But you know what? He represents Omaha. And Omaha, Nebraska is the was the home of contact centers. Mm-hmm. Largest, it's where the contact center 
industry really formed. And so it was the largest district for contact centers. Mm -hmm. So you would expect them to stand with that community. Um, but you know, you go to DC and that doesn't seem so fashionable. Right. Yeah, and sure. so, uh, I always appreciate, I'm still friends. I still hang out and stay in touch with Lee and he's such a good man. Uh, and I just loved that you had all this diversity in terms of political beliefs, in terms of locations. Uh, but when you really met with everybody, mm -hmm. they understood that there's value to being able for consumers to speak to the businesses they work with. Mm -hmm. And that the person that does that, that represents this big brand, is just a person just trying to feed their family, get yeah. through school. It's just all of a sudden to put a face to that. And they were like, we should advocate for that face. Yeah. So, yeah. So somewhere along the way, I, I want to get, I'm, a, I'm from the IT side professionally, right? Yeah, so later yeah. I want to I want to explore that and maybe talk about your your CIO that you have on board and your, your you know, technology yes. standpoint. But um, now at some point you move to Florida. So there's a Florida, then there's Omaha, and then of course later comes Huntsville. Yeah. But can you walk through now the circumstances of moving to Florida? Does does TPG move there, or in you know does it leave? When does it leave Jersey to go to Omaha? And you know, kind of talk us through the corporate offices, and and then of course you know personally, whatever your decision was to be to be there or be everywhere, to be everywhere, <laughs> yeah, be everywhere or, or nowhere, everywhere and everywhere all at the same time. So Philadelphia or Jersey um, stays, and we just need a place to open up um, and scale. And it was hard to do on the East Coast. Uh, it wasn't a contact center. I mean, it's Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. I was in Jersey, but it's close to Philly at the time. And so, I mean, you know, who, who contact centers? What's that all about? But in Omaha, be, uh, it's what is known. It's the, well, at the time, it was the number one industry of the city. So I was introduced to the city through friends, um, fell in love, uh, love the city itself. It's a fantastic city and, uh, and just became biased because it was a city that actually embraced the industry, right? It's like if you were a mechanic and you're looking for a fellow mechanics, where do you go? Like just to yeah. be of one. And so that, or in Huntsville, we're engineers, right? right? We're a home of engineers. Well, in, in Omaha at the time we were a home of the contact centers. And so they, I, I fell in love with it. I thought, oh my gosh, now I've got a city where I could say that we're in contact centers and no one would say, now what, what does that mean? <laughs> you know? And yeah. so um, I opened up there and that grew um, crazy. That was great. And it is great. Uh, and then over the years, F Florida became, um, that just became a home decision. So my family, my siblings, my um, my my husband at the time, they all wanted to move to Florida in different sectors of Florida, different areas. So I just followed along. That was just to keep family, okay, that, you know, in touch. Um, it worked, wound up working great professionally because I wound up getting to in all the work I was doing up in D.C. Our senator uh, Marco Rubio is a big advocate, and uh, it was great to spend time with him. I met. One of the biggest advocates that I spent time with was Congressman um, Kendrick Meek, who at the time was representing the South Florida. So hmm. I wound up helping to to do some of the advocacy work I was doing. But um, that was personal. That was a family. Try to keep the family together. Sure. And the family wants to be in Florida. <laughs> um, now, in Omaha, I've got a Well, let me just pull it up. This Here's an article of you opening in Omaha. Oh, and wow. it's from November of 2012. Wow. Yeah. OK. Uh, let me scroll down here. And oh wow! There he there's is. your building. That's my building. You yeah. still have it, right? Yeah, sixty thousand square feet. Yeah. Um, let's see what I want to call out here. Now, so here's what's interesting. So this 2012 TPG signs a 15 year lease with an option to buy. Yeah. What's going on with that? Because we are 11 years into that lease. Ah, uh, I know, and I should have chosen the option to buy. <laughs> oh my. God, that's one of the biggest. Uh, how did I not do that? So you're still time? you're leasing. I'm still leasing there. Okay. Yeah, and and we don't have all three floors anymore. I sublease okay the floors because I wound up um, our business changed, and we wound up. Um, although I love that building and I love I love the city, our business went from the human listening business to automated automated. Yeah, and so now we had to go find a, a third home. 
and we had to find a city that would embrace engineering. And so um, that made us change course on gotcha. that. So, yeah. So at the time of opening, you had 200 employees. Yeah. How many work in Omaha now? So today we have uh, just shy of 100. Okay. There. So you've scaled down yeah. because of automation yeah, or automation. Different, a different type of skill set yes. that's required. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, now, also in Omaha is also financial and insurance. Aren't there a lot of insurance companies there? There is. Absolutely. And I would say it's also getting known now as medical. Really? Major medical. Um, that's, the, that's the money that the state's putting in. They want to be known for um, a medical, as the medical area for the, that part of the country. And, uh, and putting tons of investment in that. So insurance, finance, and, and medical. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. then, uh, so Omaha is your, your home, your headquarters essentially, right? It was for it a long was. time. Yeah. And now Huntsville is the new headquarters. H- Huntsville is known as the new headquarters. Okay. Yeah. We officially moved the headquarters to Huntsville. So again, still love Omaha and, uh, and the team that's there, but we needed to, um, we had this idea. I had this idea, whatever it is, um, to automate further what we're doing. So now, you know, you enter a society where, Everyone's running around, even a few years ago, try, trying to say speech analytics, AI. Yeah. What does it mean, right? Right. And uh, and all the Fortune 500, it's like, you know, what have you done for me lately? Let's do something tech. And, you know, oh, you're so passe. You're listening to calls but with people. You know, it's so passe. Mm-hmm. Even though it's behavioral. So it's meaning that it's really complex what we listen for. It's not, you know, did you hear somebody sneeze or not? I and mean, it's not that. But, you know, people wanted to be more s- slick. And so um, a few years back, I decided to go um, test and build a prototype mm-hmm. on taking that method that I'm known for, that we're known for, and, uh, and, and automating it. And so we do that in 2019. And uh, so, you know, again, once terrible timing once again, because 2019, it works fabulously. We are excited we're going to open up a new office. We're going to go really expand our engineering. And then COVID hits in 2020. And so um, when the world pauses, um, we decide to double down. I just decide to get super aggressive and, uh, and find more investment and personal, my own. I've, I've been TPG's 100% um, owned by me and funded by me. But going in and figuring out how we can squeeze every nickel out of this business and go put money into building a, a true AI mm-hmm. assessment. And so that leads me to Anna. Huns- Anna and Huntsville. Yeah. Let's do this. Okay. I, I'm going to, let's just do a, a, your commercial here. You've been looking for a way to get faster and better. Meet Anna. Anna is a new AI powered cognitive computing tool that uses TPG's established collection of evaluated attributes compiled over 25 years of deep learning to analyze all of your media and generate auto scores with experienced human accuracy, but near instantaneous speed. The days of batch sampling are over. With Anna, you can analyze all of your media and gain revolutionary sentiment insights never before possible. Hi, I'm Anna your rapid, accurate, scalable solution to scoring, compliance, and real-time coaching. I'm looking forward to working with you. I mean, how awesome is that? Thank you. I love that. I love that you have that. That's so great. That's so great. Um, I mean, there's so many... (sighs) Okay, let me back up. Because at some point with the recording... I need to understand again as an IT person, and now we have we live in the cloud world, but, yeah. but there's always been infrastructure. At some point, there's more and more demand on you as a company to store all of these files mm-hmm. for for analysis, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm assuming there's you got your cold stores, and you have to have hot, you know, your hot storage, if you will, of what stuff that might be um, needed sooner than than never, you know, that yeah. type of stuff, yeah. but uh, are you, it, it, is that a huge issue that you're trying to manage and are you using just data centers? Are you just buying rack space and, you know, kind of walk me through that journey. And I, oh, I'm assuming present day, you may be more in the cloud yeah. and you're paying people to administer that and that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. But 
how much of uh, how much of my right in I'm assuming this that's been a, a big ch- a challenge. Oh yeah. And um and then how do you go about you know who are those people that you have on your team that that you you know that handle that for you? Well, so it's definitely been a challenge. And um, talk about another. Uh, education in life that I have to learn, right? So here I'm trying to figure out listening calls and now I'm a behavioral researcher and now all of a sudden I'm a, I'm in the technology industry and I'm in data and oh my God. And right. uh, and who thought, who would have ever thunk that? And uh, and so we we found ourselves, yeah, we've, you know, we partnered with hosted environments in the past and today we actually have a dual system. Um, we partner with, for clients where we have... Um, uh, non-cloud i'll say so some people don't want to talk about being in the big abstract cloud of an aws which is a partner of ours Mm -hmm. um but we work with simple helix here in in town yeah and i've um, toured their facility have you oh it's amazing yeah it's uh unbelievable unbelievable yeah Yeah. jada leo owns that company and it is extremely impressive that that group and yeah anybody who's thinking about having um, a data center partner Mm mm-hmm uh, they should start there, in my opinion. I'm I'm obviously biased, and I love it there. And um, they're just really top notch. And their CEO Scott McDaniel is awesome. Their whole team is Greg Clements, their their COO. Mm-hmm. Their whole group is really top notch, and mm-hmm. it's so impressive. And so people think, oh, it's just a data center here in Huntsville. It's no. like no, no, no. no, no. <laughs> You've not seen that. You've not seen anything like that. Well, you get to you mentioned earlier, like Six Sigma. I mean, you yeah. get to the availability. Yeah. And what people don't realize with cloud and is I get so frustrated with the government when they feel like, Oh, it's too expensive. Like there has, I, I guarantee you there's never been anywhere in the government that has built something that can rival the availability of the cloud commercially. There's yeah. no way Agreed. you don't have the backup. You don't, you can't guarantee five nines or six nines. And, and I'm, I'm going through the tour of simple helix and they're telling me this stuff. I'm like, that's like, um, that's unbelievable. Yeah. Five, five, nine, six. Like that's, if you get one nine, yeah. a lot of times or two nines, you, you might be doing well, but five or six and guarantee it. That's, that's next level. Yeah, I totally agree. And the cool thing about their business is that for businesses, you could be a small business and you're well suited for them. You yeah. could be a larger business like myself and you're well suited for them. They actually will configure a solution and partner with you. I always feel like we have partnership there. And I really, beyond the fact that it's state of the art, you know, a data cloud data storage and, yeah. and protection of, of the most important asset that I have beyond the client base, which is the, are those media mm-hmm. assets. So yeah. So we've been a partner with them. Um, that's actually how I got to, I got to Huntsville. Okay. Is, uh, the, through Simple Helix. was through Simple Helix because I was seeking a better, um, data partner, and uh, we had a group in, in Omaha, uh, and we were just getting lost in a shuffle, and they weren't able to guarantee, like you mentioned, the security levels that they had. Mm-hmm. And so I had a friend, a friend of mine called me and was like, yeah, have you heard of this company called Simple Helix? And I was like, I have not. And so they're like, well, they're in Huntsville, Alabama. You should call them. And so I did, and I toured, and that's how I got here. Now, from there, you know, we awesome. wind up, yeah, we wind up making it home ourselves but um in the beginning it was just the partnership with with that company um and i just yeah we still partners with them today do you know um do you do you ever go to the havoc games the huntsville havoc the hockey team i've i've not gone to their games i've i've been to the near the arena here so yeah little known fact most people are going to know clay sanders coleman as freak daddy he's like the on ice mc yeah so when they do like games with the kids or there's a contest and he's, he's kind of, you know, while there's a timeout or yeah. something like that, he'll come on the ice. Well, he works for Simple Helix. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And so I, his son, my son wrestled together. He used to be in radio. I've actually interviewed him. He was my episode 49. If you want to go back and watch that. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, he works over there. So I got a, I got a tour through, hit, through him. Mm-hmm. You know, of course I work for Mantech as my normal job yeah. and, you know, trying to, do what we can to figure out a way to, to leverage just the, the treasure that's there yeah. in that facility. Yeah. It's such an impressive tour, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. I've had a couple of clients come through when originally when they were like, yeah, what's this, you know, Alabama right. thing. And, uh, and every single time they walk out of that tour, 
wildly impressed. I'm oh, like, yeah. I told you. <laughs> yeah. So you, it sounds like you still have to have certain traditional, uh, yeah, to folks that fit a traditional category of monitoring calls because you have customers that yeah. maybe just want it that way. But, but on the, on the heavy IT data analytics behavioral side, you're storing this data and you're, I guess, ingesting it into different tools and you're employing people to um, create algorithms or, and, and apply your, um, your what was it, a good call? Yeah, that, a compendium, the good call. Yeah. That Basically applying that into yeah. an algorithm, right? And in, in just now, rather than um, the old school way, you have the new school way of being able to quickly just dump things right into these tools and, and do this analysis and then spit out reports and, mm-hmm. and information, mm-hmm. correct? Yeah. So you've really had to even change the type of people you're hiring. Yes. And knowing what to look for. Yes. Know, that type of thing. Yeah. So we had to change it. So I wrote um, 307 definitions. So there's three mm. we uh, of, over the years. And so how you define a good call, 300, 307 ways. And uh, so now you've got to take that and automate that. So we wound up, um, we have the good fortune and have the good fortune of recruiting Dr. Tommy Shrove here in Huntsville. And uh, he comes from the um, Department of Defense contracting side of life. And so in their past lives, they were, they were looking to assess communications Mm-hmm. Um, as government, as the Department of Defense wants to do, to be able to understand like hostile sentiment and all mm-hmm. those things, and uh, so the concept of assessing conversations wasn't foreign to him, mm-hmm. unintended there, and uh, and so I, when I talked to him about trying to what we've been doing over twenty six years at the time, uh, and in the commercial sector, he was intrigued and said, uh, and I said, here's what we've been doing, but we want to build this on steroids, like we want to build an artificial intelligence engine for. And you had to build one. We have to build a model for every one of those 307 mm. attributes. Yeah. So it's not one engine. There's, uh, it's a really sophisticated uh, technology from translating and understanding the pacing of the conversation to applying those 307 attributes, et cetera. And, that, and we wound up making Huntsville our home because it's really, as you guys all say, it's the home of engineers, right? So right. I said, can we find engineers that understand artificial intelligence and uh, and have an interest in being in the commercial software business, and uh, and that you know that was obviously a little bit new to the city. Mm-hmm. You know, it's such a heavy Department of Defense type of contracting um, business. So we were like the new newer kids on the block, not just because we were new, but also because it's commercial software. What is that? Mm-hmm. Commercial AI. What the heck is that? Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously intriguing. So uh, it's he's been he is our our captain, our leader, our fearless leader. And uh, and brought Anna to the market. So, are you tapping into the universities, and you getting interest through internships and and through just kind of academia? Because yeah. AI, you say AI, I think people are going to jump at the chance to to cut their teeth yeah. and, and gain some experience. Well, then they should apply to TPG. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we we're just getting acclimated into um, this year's been such a blur for us. You know, Anna's receptivity like everybody loves Anna and so in our commercial sector I mean we work with everybody I mean we work with from American Express to as you mentioned Toyota to UBS and United Airlines as you can mention I can go on and on and so keeping up with her has been uh, more than a full-time job so everybody wants to roll her out and embrace her our community represents 15 million phone calls a month right right and that's like just keeping up with that so back to your question about the volume of data, it's it's the largest environment of data in the commercial sector, period. Mm. And so um, we've we've been focusing on that. So yes, when people come to our door from the universities, we are we welcome them in. You're going to see us get a lot more aggressive over this next year about introducing ourselves mm-hmm. out there, yeah. um, so that they know they know we're right here. Yeah. Uh, and the first thing was just choosing downtown, right? We chose. The West Side Square, uh, which just brings us to downtown, and I love being down there. So yeah. that seems to be a very the newest one of the newer hot spots Are you down a, the city. By the way, I was just at, I uh, did karaoke at Miller's the other day, which isn't too far from your That's office. Not, yeah, <laughs> That's we, awesome. It was during the AUSA Global Week, and yeah. we had a bunch of managers in town, and one of our managers really likes karaoke. Oh, that's great! And I was like, all right, I'm gonna do it. 
That's get okay. out of your comfort zone. <laughs> I love that. I, love I actually that. did Beastie Boys. Did you? I oh. did um, Cool in the Gang Celebration because I just, you know, the lady's like, what do you want? I'm like, I don't know. There's like yeah. 10 million options. I, I, I don't know. I don't do karaoke. So I just, I come up with something. I figure maybe the audience would like to just, you know, dance to or whatever. And then I did Piano Man. And then Classic. I did Paul Revere, Beastie Boys. And then, um, and then Run DMC, It's Tricky. <laughs> oh, you gotta love that. That's so great. I love that. I know you like Tupac. I love Tupac. Yeah. I'm a huge Tupac. I grew up in that, you know, yeah. era. So yeah. But you know, you mentioned Cool the Gang. What's so funny is I went to school with uh Cool's the lead singer Cool. It's cool. Really? Yeah, I went to the, uh, to with his son. Wow. But yeah, I grew up in Newark, so that's, that's where they're right. from. And so yeah, that's hysterical that you actually mentioned that. Cool yeah. in the gang. Cool in the gang. That's classic. So I wanna um I'm kind of mentioning these we've been touching on, you know, your need to hire people. Mm -hmm. And again, you're unique, right? Like it's one thing to be the CEO of a company. It's one thing to be the president of a company or the chairman of the board, whatever it might be. But here you are, not only did you, you, you founded it, you're yeah. you're, you know, this is your thing. You own it 100%. It's your idea. You don't see that very often. Right. Um, which means the level of passion. And I know that you're, you're, your um, counter to risk is passion, mm. right? It's not about risk. It's just passion, right? Yeah. This is your passion. This is your life. Okay, well, then at some point you have to share that. And I think this becomes really hard for certain entrepreneurs. At some point you have to expand and you've got to trust other people. Mm. And Brene Brown, who you're a big fan of, yes, right? And, uh, and the whole concept of braving, which is boundaries, reliability, accountability, vault integrity non-judgment generosity and in her she has that awesome talk yes. on trust right Love um, that. and we've all been burned we've all been lied to we've all been let down by people in our lives and it goes on right there's no there's nobody that's that's exempt from that um how difficult was it for you this is your baby again this this is not like you know, I become the CEO of, of Mantech, my company tomorrow, there's 13,000 employees and it's a 53 year history. Mm. Okay. That's, that's totally different than for 26 years. This is your thing. This is your baby. You coined the phrase, you started the industry, you fought the fight in DC, right? You're working with, um, the, the biggest heads of banks and everything else to make this a, a reality. Mm-hmm. When you apply the braving concept, and, and let's just say, start with trust, how hard is that for you to, to find the right people yeah, and, and to trust them that they are going to even come close to sharing the passion and put forth the effort you've put into this? Ah, that's a hard one. Well, I'll tell you, you mentioned, if anybody hasn't listened to Brene Brown's Braving, it's the best 10 minutes of your life, yeah. in my opinion. It's really good. I love, love, love it. I've listened to it a thousand times. Um, I I listened to that because I found in the beginning that I was too trusting. By the way, here, I want to pull it up. Did I pull it up on yeah. the screen before or not? No. I don't think I did. No. So there, there, yeah. there it is. Oh, my gosh. I apologize. So, so good. So good. So people can see it now. Yeah. I send this. I, I send her... Um, her video of this to people all the time. Do you? The braving. Oh yeah, no, it's it's one of the best out Just, there. Let me go back. There we go. And and I'll tell you what helped oh, me with that. Yeah. Is that um I was trusting too much. Like I assume why wouldn't you be as passionate as me? Right. Wow, what a mistake. Right? And so I'm I'm all in. Mm -hmm. That's who I that's how I live. I live all in. Sure. So I then get um caught off guard when I'm assuming you're going to be as passionate as me and you're not. And so that's been one of the toughest lessons I've had to live as a professional is that it's a number one, it's okay. That, you know, don't assume people will be as passionate and, um, and redefine the level of trust. Yeah. It doesn't mean me not, not be trusting, but to her definition of braving, you can't trust without those words. So the first thing is know your boundaries and know and respect theirs. Mm -hmm. I had a really hard time with that. I actually have a friend who introduced me to Huntsville here who jokes with me 
that I um, boundaries, Lisa, you got to learn them, <laughs> got to learn the boundaries. Um, I, I think that was probably the 26 year journey that I had to figure out on that. Um, I, I find that when you're trusting blindly and that's what I have. I have, I, I have, uh, now if I had to say of things that I'm willing to endure mm -hmm. learning, you know, sometimes you make, if you ever repeat your mistake a thousand times and say, oh, someday I'm going to figure this one out. I, I welcome that I've had to, i this is the one that I keep repeating them because I do have the ability to, to, to try again. Mm -hmm. Cause I'll just trust, I'll just trust. Yeah. Um, but now with her, she's taught me, Hey, if, if any of these are not feeling right, then it's blind trust. And that's, they don't, they don't even want that. People don't even want that. It's like a responsibility that they're like, why are you giving this to me? Yeah. I don't want that. So I've had, a, I think that's really powerful. Um, I love that. And non, and the last piece that she talks about is like the non judgmental, like just to think the best of it, not th the person. Yeah. And, uh, and so when you, when I realized that not everybody's going to have the passion and it's okay. Yeah. Then it allows me to say, okay, for the degree you want to be in, then I trust. Yeah. For that degree. And then everybody's in a position to, to, to succeed. Not, you know, I'm not over, I'm not, not overstepping the bounds. Yeah. And then you're not feeling like, oh my God, she's trusting with this with, to a degree that I don't even, I don't even want. Why is she asking me to do this mm -hmm. type of thing? So I think as I learned that, um, it's why I think the, the Huntsville team has been so successful. It's because I just respect the boundaries and then then you can truly trust. Do you have some, though, that have really um, put everything into it and are almost as passionate as you are? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I've been in business 26 years. I have some folks who've been with me for 17, 18 years. Yeah. I have some people who are, you could describe the way you're describing, all in, that have been with me for a year. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Yeah. But for those that aren't it's okay too yeah it's like you're i look at the studio right it's a nice studio yes i'm very very proud yes, of it, it I, everything in here i've done a, a, a few times over this is actually like a remodel but and i think back to like when i first started doing like what's not wasn't called podcasting then but it was still very new and i i felt i had a tremendous level of pride in that i i could pull it off like complicated this is complicated stuff right mm -hmm. as far as all the moving parts yeah. And hoping that people would just why how would how come they wouldn't why wouldn't they appreciate this? And I was doing it like for sports, like like three hundred and twenty seven feet away from my camera, and a bot my own box on the field. Mm -hmm. I was covering games, and I and like I'm sitting here thinking like how do I just push the envelope like way ahead of my time? Yeah, way ahead of of anything because now it's just so easy. But at the same time, you're like, well, how come? I, sometimes I'm like, well, how come somebody's not as interested as I think they would be? Like even my own family, <laughs> they don't seem to care. Yeah, <laughs> I don't watch my episodes anymore. You know, it's like, yeah. well, it's just like sometimes there's dog lovers and cat lovers, and you know, there's people who like lizards or like we're all different, <laughs> right? You know, and you just can't force people. But sometimes you're like. I don't understand why more people don't care. Yeah. Look how pretty <laughs> I my think it's cool. Is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's so much fun. Come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had that even with my own family. My kids are hysterical about it. You know, my youngest is 17. And uh, although he likes to claim that he had the idea for Anna, that we're just living his his ideas. Just so, yeah. So he has to get credit for that, I guess. Um, but, you know, he's like, Mom, you're I, don't talk to me about this every day. Yeah. Right. And uh, my daughter opened up Huntsville with for me. It was one of her summer internships that she, as we call it in our family internship, meaning you have to work at TPG at some point in your yeah. life, you know. <laughs> um, and she opened up Huntsville for me. Okay. And uh, which is awesome, and she loved it. But then she's like, "Hey, I'm out because I'm my my interest is in political science." And so I'm like, "All right, well, it's okay. This isn't all of our sure. lives, you know. Sure. But it's mine. It's what I love." <laughs> yeah. Um. Oh. Sh oh. So Anna, let's. Yeah. How did the name come about? Let's start with that. Oh, yeah. So everyone thinks that it's some acronym. I guess that's the, the hip thing. But um, she is not an acronym. Her name is Anna. Like there's Siri out there and there's Anna. And right? Alexa. And there's Alexa and there's Anna. Um, so Anna is my grandmother. Okay. Anna is the woman who raised me. And, uh, and like 
this generation's Anna, she, my grandmother was ahead of her time. And uh, she was, um, my grandmother was, well, she's the, lo- the light of my life, right? And she, um, she raised me until she passed. Uh, she passed just before my eighth birthday mm. when I was living with her. And, and um, she's a source of, she's that, you know, that, that they say that um, the voice in your head, right? Yeah. Um, I still can hear her. And I'm, you know, I'm 55. I could hear her in my head all the time. I hear her voice as though it's still alive. And uh, she was she was defiant. She was this tiny little thing with this huge smile. And um, and she always made sure that she you knew that she was in your corner and she was hardworking, Mm -hmm. uh, but made her own choice in life. Uh, And when she got sick, uh, she had cancer and I watched her. uh, I watched her work yeah. Uh, even through that. And I just remember her being so strong, so strong. Uh, and even when she, you know, even when she wound up not succeeding in her, her health here, I always feel like she went down, but she came right back up on the other side of heaven. Like she's yeah. just so strong. She never gave up. Mm-hmm. And I really wanted to honor that, that, res- that resilience that my grandmother taught me and that she had. Because it's hard, you know, life is hard, and uh, and what Anna represents is that breakthrough of just being resilient and being being out in front. Yeah. And uh, and I wanted to honor her. And that was her name, Anna. Yeah, her okay. name is Anna, Anna Maria De Luca della Sala. <laughs> Not do, Italian at all. <laughs> do you, if you don't mind sharing the cert. The circumstance with your parents. Mm. So she raised you. Were yeah. you were they not in the home with you? So my parents, you know, they did the best they can with who they were and the tools they had. You know, they had their yeah. own struggling relationship. Um, they we lived in a, a two level apartment, like our townhouse, I guess we would call it today. But there were two apartments, and we were upstairs, and my grandmother was downstairs. And okay. as my parents were having their own issues, I see. Um, I just was with my grandmother. Gotcha. She was the she was the stability in my life. And then whole time. she passes and you're eight. Ah, yeah. Then just back with mom and dad and Well, my parents were divorced when I was three. So okay. there was already turmoil and, and trauma. And uh and so when she when my grandmother passes, um, I'm back with my mom and uh we're living with her. And then my grandfather stayed with us for a while. Um and but you know, it was the same. I really okay. was. I was the adult at seven. I was the, yeah. I was the adult at seven. Yeah. I have a little sister. It's not little sister anymore. She's taller than me. Uh, <laughs> but I was always uh, worried and in, in taking care of her. Gotcha. When we were kids. Uh, it is interesting. Um, the, the one thing that is enjoyable about doing this program is is just hearing all the different stories yeah. in different circumstances. Right. I have my story, and you, you know, everyone has a story. Yeah. And um, I hope it's inspiring to to other people. You know, some of it's just inspiring on like, yeah, you're, you, like you said, four foot ten Jersey girl, <laughs> right? You, you're just kind of living life and just trying to maybe have a job and figuring out how to get to the next day and the next day. And then you stumble upon this this industry yeah. that you create, you know, and it's just amazing. Thank you. And then sometimes people will be like, oh, well, maybe she came from, she probably went to Princeton. Right. You know, she's right. a trust fund baby or whatever. Yep. And like, no. Nope. That's why we do long form podcasts. So you really, now we need, we know Elisa probably even better than we did before. Yeah. And thanks. it makes, I hope that the, the TPG employees that, that listen, that they better all listen, they, uh, they see a different side or even more sides, right? To, to their boss, to their owner. Well, I appreciate that. I think I think that's why I have been asked lately to tell the story because it's not, you know, I'm not from Princeton, New Jersey, and yeah. you know, I don't have that degree. And I've uh, I've actually been asked a few times now to speak with women's forums mm-hmm. um, because my grandmother was such a major influence in my life. Um, and and you know, when you're alone at seven, yeah, you know, and you're just out there, um, that's hard. That's really hard. And I remember her, but she taught me grit. You know, she she was the original grit Mm -hmm. just to be able to just just get back up, you know, and she always said it to me. Get back up. It doesn't matter that you're down. Get up. Right. Never forget. And so you've got that 
that grit concept. And over the years, you know, I talked about the grace where my friend was like, leave nothing left unsaid, nothing left undone. I've just become really grateful for the whole journey, yeah. the chaos to it, the beauty of it, the journey of it. And, uh, and so I realized that that's become, that's like the leadership strategy that I really have. Right. Cause it's, it's not in some type of Harvard business review document. I mean, and people ask me and I've been asked to speak about this, like what's your leadership formula, whatever that means. And I'm like, listen, I am not the ex CEO <laughs> you thought it was going to be. And my strategy yeah. is grit, grace and gratitude. Right. And that's, that's the formula. And so if you have the grit and you recognize the grace that's been given to you, cause it's given to all of us in some form or other mm-hmm. it, times we don't notice it. And like somebody saying, Hey, have you just, you know, go, go call simple helix for a data summer. That's just grace that I'm introduced to that, which enters me into a whole new city yeah. at the time when we need it the most. Right. And then be so grateful for that. That simple recommendation that, changes the course of tpg yeah is just tremendous and that just comes from grace let me here's a question that now that you're 55 you don't yeah. you said you're 55 yes, you look I great for 55 thank you thank you um <laughs> but yeah, though. i'm not sure how you would have answered this at 25 35 maybe at 45 um and now at 55 but also not just the age but it somewhat coincides with obviously the success but c- would you have it any other way When you look at the way your life is and how you've turned out to the person you are, would Lisa DeFalco, owner, president, founder of TPG, be the person she is? Would TPG be where they are? Had you had mom and dad in the house? Had you had a quote unquote normal upbringing? (laughs) If I was normal. (laughs) Uh, You know, definitely not, right? You know, it's interesting you mentioned that. There's a song that's out. I don't. I just discovered it. Could, could somebody could tell me it's 50 years old? I mean, I'm you know, if you're not if Tupac, if you're not Sinatra, and you're right. not The Grateful Dead, I'm not going to hear it. Right. But um, by Mercy Me, it's uh, called Dear Younger Than Me, Dear Younger Me, and I was just turned on to it about a, a year ago. Uh, and it it's asked that question: Would you change? Would you go back if you know if you to see your younger self? Would you go back and change the course? Or would you just tell yourself it's going to be okay? Mm -hmm. And I would go back and tell myself it's going to be okay. I wouldn't change a thing. Yeah, I love, I love the journey, the downs, the ups. I, you know, I've learned that my ups are, I appreciate them more. My downs, I have more grace and gratitude that the ups will be back. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not as, um, I'm not as overwhelmed when I have downs. Because that's going to be life and business that that's guaranteed. Yeah, and uh, and the highs are, I just have gratitude for them. I'm not so euphoric about them. Yeah, and I think that's been a real. Um, it's helped me in business and also in life. So no, I wouldn't change it. I you know, you know it. Kevin O'Leary from Shark Tank. <laughs> yes, of course. He uh, he talks about uh, this is maybe two or three years ago, so it could be dated. But at the time, he had 39 companies in his portfolio. And he was like, you know, every day, every single day, something in those one of those 39 companies, like spectacular will happen, unexpected, positive, amazing, <laughs> right? Like every day, yeah. just just unbelievable success or news or whatever it may be. But at the same time, every single day, something horrible, tragic, something you wouldn't wish on anyone just the worst bad news will happen every single day with one of those 39 companies. Yeah. And that's just like the life of CEO life of ownership life of you. Yeah. You, um, you live in a, there's only a certain percentage of people really that are kind of cut from that cloth Yes, that can kind of handle it. But that's just the, that's the reality. You have to continue on being Lisa DeFalco, mother of three. And you know, like, those things are just going to happen. I totally good, agree. bad, and different. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and it's just you just kind of get conditioned to it when you when you realize that's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. It's nothing personal. No, it just happens. It just happens. I think when you learn that, that's where the the gratitude comes in, because you just realize you're going to get up the next day. Yeah. You know, I mean, you have. You can't, I don't know how an entrepreneur could be in business and not have grit. I really don't know mm-hmm. that. Cause you just, there, you're right. It's, it's a certain cloth. And I, res, I understand that. I, I, um, 
I don't know. And I, and my own kids, when they say they want to do their own thing, I'm like, oh, think twice. Mm-hmm. Just be care. Just be aware of the life you choose on that, because yeah. it's not. You're not. When people say I'm going to own my own business and I'm going to check out at five o'clock, I'm like, yeah. So no. in three years, you should re- review your resume, <laughs> right? And you just because it just doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. So I respect that. And if you could really appreciate that, it all works out. Like I have some people around me in Huntsville who were like. Why are you always so optimistic? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, it's just because I've been there. I, I just know it always works out. Like, I, I truly believe it will always work out. Mm-hmm. I just, you have to have the grit to work out, you know, because during those tough times, you have to have that grit to get back up the next day when you don't want to, with Kevin and O'Leary saying. And you have to be able to celebrate those positive moments and yeah. recognize it'll always work out. So I've never, well, I own my own company, of course. Yeah. But not, um, nothing like TPG, right? But I have certainly ran big PNL on like three hundred million dollar programs and things like that, where it's it's somewhat similar, right? Like yeah. every decision you make has some impact, right? Yeah. And, and ultimately performance. Um, but when you again going back to the unique situation in which you're in, this is similar to like the Mark Zuckerberg's and the Elon Musk, who they founded a company and they were the mad scientist of that chief engineer chief innovator, right? Yeah. That's that's you. And there's only so many that are the mad scientist plus, you know, the, the business side. Does it infuriate you when you have those people, though, that um, this is, I don't know how to, how to describe this. Um, well, you make too much money. <laughs> or, you know, why should, um, you should share more, mm. you know, Lisa, of, yeah. of what you have with the rest of us. Um, and you know what I mean? It's just kind of that, that, yeah, it's a socialistic type thing, right? Hey, you know, you, 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 like they want to take away from your success. They want to just take away, it it accuse you. If you want to give yourself a bonus, you give yourself a bonus, Mm -hmm. right? Whatever amount is appropriate. Right. But at the same time, you're the one going to bed every night with those, with those troubles, those stresses, and those worries of being a CEO and laying your head on the pillow. Hopefully, hopefully you can sleep, mm-hmm. right? And there's probably been nights where you didn't I'm sleep, not. and you've had tremors, and you've yeah. had you've had anxiety, and depression, or whatever, and you soldier on, and you soldier on, and it just infuriates me. People who don't realize what they're what they're suggesting. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not saying that. Okay, there's going to be some exorbitant bonuses paid. I, I get that. But, but at the same time, if you're a company owner and you put the blood, sweat, and tears into something and you've had to manage through technological change, um, just now going shifting away now to more of a, you know, an AI, you know, type yeah. thing, right? That's, that's tough. Mm-hmm. And do you have the right people on board? And then for someone just to suggest, oh, you just have to, you know, give your stuff away because you're a good person. I, I have a real problem with that. And I don't know how you feel about something like that, just kind of given who you are in your situation. Yeah, I. Um, it's make- interesting that people do that, right? I, between doing that and then just criticizing the way you go about it, the combination. Like, first of all, thank you for putting me in that category. Five years ago, I would have not embraced that at all. Mm. I would have been like, "Oh, that they're smart. I'm something different." And uh, but I recognize now at 55, what I, what I've done and who I am. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think it's, you have to get a thick skin and that's really sad. You have to, you have to develop that Mm -hmm. because you're going to have people who say you should do more and you should give more. And why are you successful? And, but meanwhile, they wouldn't, that's why I tell my kids, I walk a half a step away from the impossible. Yeah. And most people will not do that, nor should they choose. But those who choose this, then uh, what's what's just des- what's deserving is just an ounce of respect. And if you can't deliver that, how about an ounce of grace? Yeah, just some grace and compassion out here. Yeah, right. And and but there's so many people who are that you know they just won't do that for you. They just they're going to cr- criticize how much you make. They're going to criticize how you go about running your business, how you go about running your life, what you're you know what you per- they perceive you to be. You know, and uh, and there's always that. Social media is the worst of that. It gives you the the platform to criticize things that people have no idea what they're talking about. Yeah. Right. So you have to be tough. That's where the grit comes in. 
or the those people that you know all families have them where there's that one person that can't even really take care of themselves yeah and be independent and yet they're asking you for money yeah and you're thinking you know i i get up at 4 a.m every day yeah. i don't know what time you get up or i don't sleep and um, i've got a thousand things on my plate i'm raised i've raised my own three of my own kids yeah put them through college yet you somehow can't figure out how to tie your shoes yeah and get a get a job or whatever and just take care of yourself yeah yeah and now it's, i have to take care of you and you probably you're gonna go behind my back and say all these terrible things about me what a terrible person i am even though you know i'm supposed to give you money yeah well i have found that when it comes to somebody that is closer to me like that um and i might know a few of those i might be able to relate to that a little bit um i actually i actually look back and think about my grandmother every time and i have enormous compassion for that person. Mm -hmm. And so I'm known to give um, in that I'm known for that. And I think about my grandmother who walked the walk and, you know, I mean, she was a seamstress, so it's not like we come from anything. She, you know, she was trying to make uh, nickels meat. Right. And mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that, but that's how she lived. And yet she would always be there for the family and so I think about that and say, boy, if she would have had compassion for this person, then who am I not to? Yeah. And so that's been that allows me to sleep a little bit because I do have those people. Yeah. Who uh, who know me by first name, who are you know what's in it for me, Lisa? You know. Yeah. yeah and I and I always catch myself yeah. coming across it, but I also catch myself and say, okay, let me evaluate where that person's coming from. Yeah. And, and and I'm like you usually I I cave or give in or like you know what you just love people. Yes. Right? Just keep loving them and maybe you know there'll be that last that that time that it just clicks. Yeah. You know and but through your generosity it, you you actually were making a positive difference. And then you could just hope that you're making a positive yeah. difference. And if not um then you know that you're you tried. You tried. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. Love that. Um, all right, I got some pictures. Oh gosh, let's, let's go through them. Okay, so it'll be, okay. Again, these are these are um, pictures that you posted. Okay, oh, but no. I'd love to just get the commentary. I couldn't I couldn't show them all. I think I have okay. six or seven here. That's hysterical. And just show me, uh, talk me through who they are. Oh my god, I love that. So that is my sister and my niece, and uh, oh my god, I that is us not that long ago they encouraged me to go see bob weir the grateful dead okay and i hadn't seen the grateful dead in 25 years and we met up in denver uh, my beautiful niece in the middle is going to be uh getting married in new york city this october hey yeah she my sister and i raised she has my sister has two children i have three we decided 30 years ago we were going to raise our five children as siblings so okay. our five children are as close as siblings. Okay. And so um, they call, you know, cousin, but really they're like brother and sister. And so we do every holiday together. We travel on family vacation every year together. We are just there for each other. Um, and it's a really special relationship that the five of them have. So that's awesome. Yeah. I love, I love that photo. Are you wearing, is that a Casey? Are you wearing a Kansas City Chiefs? Is that my eyes? I should put my glasses on. On the, the pin? Yeah. Is that that's your... a Grateful Dead Oh, pin. that's a Grateful that's Dead? That's a Grateful Dead. Hold it's on. hysterical. Well, it's, red, it's like red and white. Yeah. So, and it's I'm a, not wearing my glasses. It's a deadhead pin. Okay. That's me going back to my deadhead roots. I, I love that. I love that. Next one. This is your family. Oh, my God. My babies. My, the loves of my life. That's my daughter, Sydney. My oldest son, Ryan. The six foot two giant. And my youngest son, Drew. So, where and this is in where is this taken? This uh, back to my sister and kids and her kids. We were all together as a family. We were in St. Augustine. We mm. used to spend every year in St. Augustine around Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean it's only three hours away from us, or the summer, one of the two. And this was the clearly the fall, so we were all in St. Augustine together. I love St. Augustine. It's beautiful, There's isn't a, it? The 1905 restaurant's a Cuban restaurant. Oh there. yeah, we know it. Yeah, and that's this, a great. There's this salad. My wife will like if she comes across something, she'll make it like almost too much where yeah. we get sick of it. Yeah. But they have like the salad. 
Yes. And we made it the 1905 salad. Yeah. And we made it like four weeks in a row. Like, okay, can we just pause? Love it. From this. <laughs> you know, I love that. So it's called the Columbia Restaurant. Yeah, the Columbia Restaurant. And it actually oh. started in Tampa. It's still there. And there's one in Sarasota where we live. And there's one, as you mentioned. That's Cuban, Augustine. right? It's Cuban. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's out. It's outrageous, and that's where we went that day. It's so funny you mentioned. Oh, really? That. Yeah, we go there all the time. Right down on that. It's like that pedestrian yeah. um, w- mall. Yes. Yeah. So when we do something as a family, I know uh, maybe not everybody's twenty one, but we do something called sip and stroll. Okay. So we stop and have cocktails, <laughs> and then we stroll, and then we have cocktails, yeah. and then we stroll, and then we make our way to Columbia. <laughs> so I used to have a home. A lot of my family lived in Palm Coast, which is just south of St. Augustine. Yes. Basically, the, like one of the next exits down. Yeah. And uh, so we spent a lot of time up there. And what I the beach I love to go to is called Crescent Beach. Yeah. And it's just south of St. Augustine. Uh, before you get to like, was it Alligator Land? I think it's before that. Before that. Yes, but there's it is. like this. There's this one restaurant. It's like Sunset Grill. Okay. I have and then that one. The, the sand there is like brilliant white. Mm-hmm. No one really ever goes there. But at least you have like you have the public bathhouse. You yeah. have this restaurant and you have the beach. It's such a great area. My sister actually has her house in Flagler, which is oh, yeah. just south of that, right in Flagler the Palm Coast. Yeah, yeah. So that's we spend, and every year we forced our kids for ten years, eight years. We bought, we rent, rent a house in St. Augustine mm-hmm. on the beach, and every summer you had to spend a week. You had to. I don't yeah. care what we were doing. You had to spend the week with the, with their family. So you're familiar with snack jacks? Yes, I love I snack, snack jacks. jacks. I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> Small world. All right, here's the next. Okay. Oh, I'm going to go this way. There we go. Oh, wow. So, oh, I love that photo for so many reasons. So, to start, the woman speaking is uh, Pastor Lisa Nelson from the Rock Community Church here. Okay, yeah. Love her and Rusty. What a beautiful church. What an amazing group of people. What an amazing two spiritual and just humans in life. Um, I'm friends with Lisa and Rusty. I'm honored to be friends with them. And I asked her to speak and say a prayer at our, this is our ribbon cutting. And, uh, and so what a blessed day that is. And so the funny thing about the ribbon cutting, we get so busy. So I I also love our mayor. Like I'm, I just love Huntsville. Like I'm like the walking as, as, uh, (laughs) as mayor battle says, I'm the walking chamber here. Right. Right. (laughs) So, uh, I, I asked uh, our mayor, to help us do a ribbon cutting. He says, okay, he'd be happy to do that. And then life gets busy. And so I'm having lunch with him one time and he said, you never, you never did a ribbon cutting. It's been a year. And I said, I know I got so busy. And I, I said to him, we're just celebrating a hundred employees. He said, well, we should do a hundredth anniversary and do the ribbon cutting then. So we did. <laughs> so he was kind enough to uh, be there as you could see him in the background uh, yeah. The chamber there, and uh, and and Dr. Tommy Shrove was standing behind Lisa, who's our CIO and our leader here in in Huntsville. So that's such a special day. That's cool. And how long ago was that? Last year? Uh, just September. September. Yeah, September last year. I love that. Oh my God, another great one. So I love this one. This is a great one too because this is uh, this is in Omaha, and um, and so this is a photo of. Omaha and Huntsville coming together in Omaha. So the first trip that we took of our Omaha, our Huntsville team, uh, that's, and then introducing them to Omaha so that Omaha recognized that we are all one family, that I wasn't leaving Omaha. I mm-hmm. was just starting and opening up Huntsville. And that's with that um, breaking bread. As I always say, you got to break bread. I break bread. Um, that's how I do business, right? <laughs> yeah. I lo- I'm Italian. You got to break bread. Are you Sicilian? Sicilian. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally Sicilian. So we break bread and uh, and that's what we're doing to tell everybody we're all one. Love okay. that photo. Here's some more breaking bread. Oh, my God. So this breaking bread, I love this one, too. Um, this is hysterical. This is, this is at... Um, Oh God, this is such a special night. Um, this is at an industry conference. Now I hadn't been to an industry conference in eight or nine years. I hadn't been on the stage and the conferences I did prior to that for the industry, I was, um, the chairwoman of the board of directors of our a trade association. So I was always doing hmm. community service. I had not been to a conference in that period of time. And I certainly hadn't done it, um, to be an exhibitor a vendor. Oh sure. my God, I hadn't done that. Right. So I asked a group of clients who are friends of mine, this is the week before Christmas. 
because they had this like COVID replacement event and I was being, we're going to be recognized. And would you fly across the country and stand with us as we were introducing Anna to the world? Is this in Vegas? This is in Vegas. Mm -hmm. And those phenomenal people, friends of mine, clients of mine, flew across the country, like literally eight days before Christmas, and stood with us as we introduced Anna to the market. That's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty special. That's really cool. Now some top golf action. <laughs> I love this. So top golf. So this is welcome to Huntsville. We this is the first team uh, grouping that we did, and our team's still with us. And uh, in fact, um, in that in that photo, um, that was the first. We had just recruited everybody. We didn't even have an office. And we were just trying to do a team building mm. here. And so in that photo, you have uh, it, team team members, uh, Mitch Ledbetter, who is now in our um, data analytics business, who's standing next to me. Cecilia was one of our first analysts who listens to calls, now runs the Huntsville office for us, runs the whole site. Chastity Alexander and Mirji are now lead voices in our behavioral science business. Michelle Ginn, the blonde in the back, she is one of our leaders in behavioral science. And then wrapping up, Shana Mitchell is um, one of our executives. She is our, uh, she's our executive running all of our corporate administration. And this was their like first, first week, wow. right? And uh, Cam and Andrew Cook in the back of Omaha were opening up the office with me. Wow. Yeah, that's really... That's wow. That's such a cool photo. Let's see here. That was like the future of uh, Omaha to be. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so my sister and I, again, um, partners in crime and uh, my sister owns her own um, direct marketing business, does all of our direct marketing, social media, et cetera. And this was her 50th birthday. Mm. And what she wanted to do was go to Italy and tour around Italy and take uh, taking lessons on how to make Italian food, and here we are making uh, pasta in, um, in Italy. In Italy, yeah, okay. we were actually right outside Luca and uh, cooking the Italian. Yeah, learning how to be Italian women, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm failing. What you're seeing me is her succeeding and me questioning my life. <laughs> and I think that's it. That's hysterical. That's oh, my God. By the way, speaking of trade shows, um, you got one coming up. We do. Very excited about that. June 20th. June 20th. Yes. We we used to do an annual client gathering, private forum to really just have our clients share what they're how they're benefiting from TPG, the mm -hmm. work they're doing and how it's benefiting their businesses. And now um, we brought it back. After COVID, we attached it to this industry conference. So our clients get to come in for a day and a half with us. Mm -hmm. um, and then they get um, a complimentary pass to go to this industry conference. That's my gift to being part of our community. So that, yeah. And it's is that part of like just call center conference in Vegas, you yeah, said? Yeah, it's, it's called Customer um, customer Contact Week, CCW. Okay. And it's the largest for so any business. I mean, think sure. about all the businesses. Everybody has a contact center. Yeah. And this is the annual gathering. Um, there'll be about four or 5,000 people mm -hmm. there throughout the whole week and uh, about 100 different trade exhibitor booths. And um, last year, I was one of the keynotes with um, my friend over at United Airlines. We were one of the speakers. Um, this week, this year, we were asked to do it, and I just wanted to spend the time yeah. with our community to really spend the day with our clients. And uh, but yeah, we're going to be there. It's going to be it's going to be awesome. That's cool. Um, all right, I got I got six questions for you. Okay. And oh, I'm gonna gosh. put I'm gonna put my glasses on. Back to the glasses. So yeah, I'm, I never took them off. So yeah. <laughs> I'm to, at the age where you can't even take them off if you want to see it all. I need to get better at that. But I figured <laughs> I was going to do name that tune, but I didn't decided not to do that because okay. I wasn't sure like how to even, you know, Grateful Dead to Sinatra to Tupac. That's an interesting um, um, mix. If that doesn't describe me, I don't know what else does. <laughs> all right. First one. Some of these are these are simple. Okay. And some of these just a little explanation. First is your favorite number. Uh, my favorite number is two. Two. Okay. One person 
that you could go back to and apologize to in life. Could even be a teacher. Sometimes I've used that as like a you have a teacher that you like didn't realize you were actually learning a lot from and whatever. But anybody you want to go back and apologize to? Um, the one person I went back to apologize to, and I wish I could still do it, is my my dear friend Tim Searcy, who gave me so much and was my mentor, my champion, um, opened up so many things. And I I got angry at him the last really? five years of his life. And he had to call me to help me make sure that he didn't cross over without having that, you know, that moment. Um, moment was about four months together at the end of a good friend with he and his wife. Um, and I wish I can go back again and be like, I am so sorry yeah. that I left that. I left something unsaid yeah. at that moment. So, yeah. All right. So you're with your besties. You've got some besties, right? I, some I saw besties. some other pictures I didn't. Yeah, I, I guess I got a lot. Yeah. You got some besties. I got right? some besties. I got right. some besties here in Huntsville. I got some besties in Florida. Okay. Yeah. So you're with your 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 besties and you're on it's a Friday night. Could even be a Saturday night. And downtown. Perfect weather. And a concert's just letting out of like the Probst Arena, Von Braun. Okay. And you're rolling with your windows down and you're cranking a song that you want everyone to hear and everyone in the car is going to sing to, right? Like you're going to put on a spectacle because you're one of the only cars that can kind of drive slowly down in that area okay. as the streets are just full of people. What are you listening to? Oh, so I'm, <laughs> I probably listen to the Grateful Dead. Okay. And I'm listening to Sugar Magnolia. Sugar Magnolia. Yeah. I love that. And all your bus- besties know the words. They all know the words. Okay. Absolutely. Favorite ice cream? Um, Flavor. Mint chocolate chip. Mint chocolate chip. Do you also put like extra chocolate and stuff on it? And chocolate sprinkles. Okay. If you have a superpower, other than your, you've already declared that your superpowers work. Yeah. But if you like, and when we talk about imaginary superpowers, what would you want your superpower to be? If I had a superpower, my superpower would be, um, my superpower would be, be able to have, to meditate and have peace more. Okay. That would be, I practice that all the time. I wish I really had that as a superpower. You do yoga. I do yoga. That does that help? I meditate. I do as, yeah. But no, I, I wish that was my superpower. Okay. So you're going to go to Vegas. Yes. It's like the thing is at Caesars. Yes. What did, what are your top three things? I want, I want, let's just, let's assume one of your besties goes with you. Okay? Well, she is. So go ahead. <laughs> Another best. Someone who's never been to Vegas. Okay. okay. What are the top three things that you want them to experience while they're in Vegas? Well, of course, TPG's innovation to summit. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> of course. I mean, they've got to hang with Anna. Um, so I'm a foodie. So I just have a whole host of restaurants, and I love great wine. Okay. So if you're, I, they are going to have to go up and down the strip with me and hang out at the best restaurants and drink some fabulous wine. Okay. That's what I, and that, honestly, that's a great vacation. I could do that for days. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> well, Lisa, uh, do you have any final thoughts or shout outs? So, um, well, first of all, the shout out to you. Thank you so much for inviting me. You're welcome. This has been a lot of fun. I love, I love your podcast. As I said, I love the city. You know, the shout out is just to this whole city. I love our mayor. I just, I think this is such a great, a great city. I mm-hmm. love the downtown and I'm just so grateful that the entire city has been so welcoming to, to me, to TPG, but to me as an individual, I think it's just so awesome. And I want to thank Mike Ledbetter, who introduced us here to here in uh, good old Huntsville. Yeah, he's a friend, the friend of mine that from Colsa that introduced me here to Huntsville. Oh. And uh, I love, I would be, I wouldn't be able to sleep if I didn't do that shout out. He's he's the reason we found it, and uh, and he's spot on. This is a great city, and I want to thank all of TPGers that are here. They just have a, they're just great, great souls, fun people, smart as whips, and just yeah. great souls. It was fun the the day that I met you over in your office yeah. and just kind of seeing that interaction where you kind of come in, hey, everybody, <laughs> you know, and just, I love that. I kind of miss that. I used to, you know, run a big program and, and I enjoyed the interactions with people. And, you know, now I don't have that as much on a day-to-day basis, but just to see that kind of 
um, they, uh, you know, the reverence towards you, you know, the boss is here mm -hmm. and, you know, you had some meetings going on and just the hustle and bustle. And I was like, wow, Lisa created all this. It's yeah, really thank cool. You. I call us TPGers. TPGers. And we're in, living in TPG land. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lisa, I, I look forward to the next time we have you on because uh, Anna is the newest thing, right? Yes, and I know is. that's it's it's full steam ahead. All the best in Vegas as you show that to industry and others. And um, I mean, like you said, it's you're going to be you're going to continue to be successful. And I, I yeah. congratulate you in advance. Thank you, my friend. I All appreciate right. you. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you.